Hello everyone, welcome back to Z Physics. Today we're going to be revising the whole of medical physics. This video will be following the OCR Physics A specification, however, as always, the physics is applicable to all exam boards. Please have a look at the timestamps of this video and can use the individual chapters to navigate. So for instance, if you're interested in just how the gamma camera works, you can go to that part. Okay, well, let's get started because as you guys can see, I've prepared quite a lot of material to actually go through. Our first focus will be the x-ray tube. So how does an x-ray tube actually work? Here's a little diagram. We need a high voltage power supply of the order of maybe even hundreds of thousands of volts and that is connected to a heater element which uh, will actually accelerate electrons and the electrons are going to be hitting a target. This whole apparatus is encased here with a little window where some x-rays are going to be emerging out of the target when the electrons are decelerated. The basic idea is that the electric current, the really, really high electric current, so this is a very high electric current, so let's just underline this, and it heats up the filament which releases electrons. So the electrons are flying towards the target and once they hit the target, they actually emit the x-rays. This process is known as Bremsstrahlung in German and the actual x-rays are going to be uh, going along this line over here. This process is very, very inefficient, so only 1% of the kinetic energy of the electrons is converted into X-ray energy. So let me guide you guys for an example problem. Calculate the minimum wavelength of an X-ray when 150 kilovolt potential is used to accelerate it. In those types of problems, we said the electron energy equal to the photon energy. Our electron energy is just given by charge times voltage, which is commonly written as EV. And that is equal to HC over lambda, which is our photon energy over here. So all I've done from this line to this line is just rearrange for the wavelength. So the wavelength is equal to HC divided by EV. Now carefully substituting the values, remember H is of course equal to 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34. This is just Planck's constant, C is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8, 150 kilovolts, so that's 150 times 10 to the power of 3, multiplied by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. For to plug in these numbers into a calculator, we're going to get about 8.3 times 10 to the power of minus 12 meters. A question can also ask us for the maximum frequency and this is my second example because I want to cover absolutely everything that you can be possibly asked. Now will be to calculate the maximum frequency when 150 kilovolt potential is used. In this case we're just going to set our electrons energy EV to HF because this is another way of writing the um, the equation for the energy of a photon. So our frequency will be EV divided by H, which uh, in turn will be just 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 multiplied by 150 kilovolts, so that's times 10 to the power of 3, divided by H, which is Planck's constant, so 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34. Four, and uh, this gives us a frequency of about 3.6 multiplied by 10 to the power of 19. By the way guys, if you are still enjoying this video and uh, most importantly, if you're finding this video useful, please consider giving this uh, video a like and subscribing to the channel. Okay, now back to X-ray absorption mechanisms, which is the next part of the specification. So there are a few different ways that an X-ray can interact with an atom. We're gonna start off with low energies and we're gonna be moving on to some 
higher energies. Now, different things will be happening depending on the energy of the incoming X-ray. So uh, let's say that we have um, an X-ray um, which has quite low energy. If the X-ray has an energy below the work function, so remember that is the minimum amount of energy required to lease an electron, then the X-ray will simply be scattered. And this type of interaction is known as a simple scatter. So in this case, if I had an incoming uh, X-ray, so let's say that this is the, uh, the, the X-ray, uh, then the X-ray will just follow along um, some different trajectory. So there will be no energy loss, but it will be moving in a different direction afterwards. No electron is emitted, it's just a simple scatter. Okay, now the next one is known as Compton scattering and this occurs at higher energies. So the incoming X-ray actually has enough energy to remove an electron. So you can see over here the electron is removed, there's a little arrow pointing towards here and the x-ray the original x-ray is absorbed however we have um, uh, we have more energy left over after the x-ray has been uh, has been absorbed so a lower energy x-ray is scattered i've actually drawn this with the color red here just to specify that it has a uh, a lower energy. So once again with Compton scattering the x-ray is absorbed, there's still some energy left and uh, the uh, there's a remaining x-ray scattered in a different direction but with a lowered energy. Okay, next one is known as pair production and in pair production the incoming x-ray has a high enough energy that interacts with the nucleus of an atom. Now it's such high energy that uh, it will actually be able to produce a positron and electron pair that will annihilate and uh, this is actually can uh, can be easily found in a detector because you can calculate the energy and uh, see what uh, uh, what um, energy spike uh, you're after and uh, this produces an electron-positron pair, they normally just annihilate and produce a pair of lower energy photons. Now a very typical question, so please make a note of that, is illustrated over here. Calculate the minimum energy of an incoming X-ray photon for pair production to actually happen. In order to do that, we're going to be using uh, delta E is equal to delta MC squared. And for our delta M, so just write it down over here, our delta M will be twice the mass of an electron, like so, which is just two times 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kilograms. So we can calculate our delta E, so which is going to be just 2 times 9.11 times 10 to the power minus 31 multiplied by 3.0 times 10 to the 8, all of it squared, and giving us a change of energy of 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules, which is about 1 mega electron volts. So about 1.02 times 10 to the power of 6 electron volts. And that's the energy spike that you actually get um, if you have, let's say, a radioactive material that is uh, producing an X-ray and the X-ray um, will be then producing an electron-positron pair. And this is uh, really easily uh, found in detectors because you can just find this spike of about 1.02 mega electron volts. The actual wavelength, uh, the minimum wavelength, is just found by E is equal to HC over lambda, i.e. lambda is just hc over e, which is going to give us 1.2 times 10 to the power of minus 12 meters. Okay, so now let's move on to our final attenuation mechanism or absorption mechanism, and that is the photoelectric effect. Now, in the photoelectric effect, you guys will be familiar from, with this from first year, an X-ray is absorbed by the electron, and the electron uses this energy to essentially escape the atom. So if you have an, uh, an X-ray here, which is interacting with an electron, so this here is uh, just, just, just an electron, after the interaction, uh, we're just gonna have a little escaped electron like 
so and it's released with some amount of energy just as a recap from first year this is actually governed by einstein's equation which is of course that the photon energy which is hf will be equal to the minimum energy required for an electron to escape plus the um, maximum kinetic energy of that photoelectron and that is einstein's photoelectric effect equation Okay, now let's have a look at the X-ray attenuation coefficient, which is this equation here, I is equal to I naught e to the minus mu X. Now, attenuation just simply means absorption. So if I have a given tissue, how much X-rays is it actually going to absorb? In this case, I here is just the final intensity. Uh, I naught is our original X-ray intensity, and mu is known as the attenuation coefficient. It just simply tells you how much x-rays are absorbed. So uh, something like bone, for instance, will have a pretty high attenuation coefficient mu, but something like soft tissue, for instance, muscle may have a pretty low attenuation coefficient. X here is the thickness, which also kind of makes sense. If you think about it, if something is very, very thick, it will absorb more x-rays. Now let's practice rearranging this for the attenuation coefficient. We need to be comfortable rearranging uh, exponential equations um, in, um, in A-level physics. So let's just rewrite it down over here. i is equal to i naught e to the minus mu x. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to put i naught onto one, one side. And what I'm going to get is i over i naught is equal to mu x. Uh, should we just zoom in so we can just focus in on this problem. Now our second thing would be to take the natural logs of both sides. I'm going to get ln of i over i naught is equal to ln of e to the power of mu x. And um, now what I get is uh, ln of i over i naught is equal to minus mu x because ln and e are inverse functions of each other. Now because I have a minus sign here, I'm going to multiply both sides by minus one. So um, that means that I can actually flip the logarithm. So I'm going to have minus ln of i over i naught is equal to mu times x and minus ln of i over i naught is equal to the natural log of i naught over i and that is equal to mu x if you're unsure how i um how i got this please have a look at my logs video maybe i'll just leave a link in the description for this um to have a look if you're a little bit unsure about logs. Okay, well, now let's just rearrange for our attenuation coefficient mu, which will just be equal to ln of i naught over i divided by x. Next, let's revise the x-ray characteristics. Now, what do I mean by that? So imagine that I have a beam of electrons. Let's just draw them over here, some negative electrons, and they strike a target. And using Bremsstrahlung, we get some x-rays emerging like this. So what sort of wavelengths are going to be expecting? So here we have a graph of the intensity of the x-rays as a function of the wavelength. So uh, we can expect the following curve. We can see that there are two peaks over here which are known as K lines and this whole process is known once again just as this word here which is Bremsstrahlung comes from German and all it means is wavelength radiation. So this type of curve is produced once again by electrons just striking the target. The narrow K lines are just characteristics of the target so they simply depend on really the electron shelf configuration and um, the way they're produced actually is really really interesting so 
when the electrons are essentially bombarding the target, they remove electrons to kind of close to the nuclei. So if you can imagine the, 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 the different shells, so maybe there's an electron here, which kind of gets uh, removed and uh, the gap, which means that there will be a gap here. So another electron will go down the energy level. And uh, when an electron drops, like so, high energy photons are actually released. And we need to be able to explain this, uh, this curve. And I've written up here a little um, explanation of this. Okay, well, another question they may potentially ask us is to use this figure to estimate the maximum accelerating PD. Okay, well, the maximum accelerating PD um, will actually come from the minimum wavelength. The reason for that is because EV, which is our electron energy, is equal to the photon or the X-ray energy, which is HC of a lambda. So over here on the on the left, we have. Should we just label this? This here is our electron energy, like. So. So, and this one here is our X-ray photon energy. So V, just rearranging for V, will just simply be HC over E lambda, like that. And let's just use the figure to try and estimate it. So H, as we know, is 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 times the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8. And uh, we can divide this by the electron charge, 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. Now, what wavelength am I going to use? If I'm looking for the maximum accelerating PD, well, then I'll be looking for the minimum wavelength. Uh, the reason for that is because I get maximum energy, maximum PD at the minimum wavelength. So the minimum wavelength is around here. Let's just use, let's say, 2.5 times 10 to the power of minus 11. So 2.5 times 10 to the power of minus 11. And let's put all of this into a calculator. And if we uh, do that, we're going to get about 49,725 volts. So let's just uh, round it up to, let's say, 50,000 volts. So the, the voltage that's produced, this type of characteristics here, will be around about 50,000 volts. Volts. Now, how would this graph change if the accelerating PD is increased? This here is yet another question. So the idea here is that if we were to increase the voltage, the kinetic energy of the electrons will increase, so the maximum energy of the X-rays will also increase, but the shortest wavelength will actually increase decrease. So we're expecting a, um, a little uh, shift with some higher peaks like that, like so. It is also really important to know that the individual wavelengths of the K lines will remain unchanged as those only depend on the target of the material. So notice how the location of the peaks remains uh, unchanged. So the peaks are directly above it. Uh, however, the minimum wavelength has now been shifted to be a little bit lower. Okay, well, let's carry on with our revision. And uh, you guys can see that we've already been revising quite a, a lot. Now, um, X-rays and contrast media is something that, uh, that we need to know about, at least as general knowledge. It's also really, really interesting. So um, when doctors are taking X-rays, they often use uh, what are known as uh, contrast media to try and essentially improve the, uh, the resolution and just to improve the image. This is because a lot of soft tissue uh, tend to have pretty similar X-ray attenuation coefficients as uh, we've discussed here. So this is just um, our coefficient mu. So to improve this, a contrasting medium is used and both barium or iodine are the two materials and we need to know this 
for the exam. Typically just inject it into the patient or a barium meal could also be just uh, digested. And the contrast medium absorbs x-rays due to the high number of protons. Um, interestingly, actually mu happens to be proportional to the atomic number Z cubed where Z, of course, is the atomic number. The contrasting medium allows for outlines of soft tissue to be seen. So you can't get a perfect image. You need to use other techniques for that. But uh, um, you can definitely uh, use the contrast media to improve the images. If you're interested in that, uh, have a look at some images online. So just Google x-rays and contrast media. we are able to find quite a lot of examples on how they work. Okay, now because this is a revision video, let's move on to the CAT scan. Contrary to popular belief, this is not a scan of a cat, although it could be. Okay, now a CAT scan, how does it actually work? So here is, uh, let's say our patient is, uh, is here somewhere or some tissue, soft tissue over here. And uh, this here is our CAT scan. So essentially it's an x-ray tube, exactly like the ones that we talked about earlier, that is just rotated around the patient. It's important to know that we're going to be using a thin fan-shaped beam so we use this thin fan shaped beam um, in order for the x-rays to be absorbed differently by different tissues. So the intensity of the x-rays is recorded by the detector, which is just over here. So by rotating the x-ray tube, which is rotating around, this allows for images of uh, slices of the patient or cross-sectional areas to be taken. And as the x-ray moves along different parts, a computer system can actually generate a 3D image. Now, a typical question would be to look at some advantages and disadvantages. In terms of advantages, first off, the x-ray scan is much quicker and it's much cheaper compared to a CAT scan. However, a CAT scan could potentially produce a 3D image, which can be invaluable for some diagnoses. Additionally, an x-ray though, on the other hand, can be harmful and some CAT scans can be prolonged because essentially you're taking multiple x-ray images. So a CAT scan is more harmful, harmful than an individual x-ray. Okay guys, we've actually now revised the whole of x-rays and we'll be moving on to medical traces. So x-rays are absolutely great at diagnosing things such as fractures, but looking at soft tissue is actually really, really tricky. So in order to look at soft tissue, we need to use MRIs, or the use of medical tracer. Now, what is a medical tracer? In short, it's simply a radioactive substance which is either injected into the patient or it's digested and it's used for the diagnosis or the treatment of a patient. There are certain properties that they must possess. First off, they have to be gamma sources. And this way, they can actually pass through the tissues. Something like alpha radiation can be, uh, well, very harmful but also can be just stopped by a uh, just just a piece of paper so they need to be gamma sources which means that it can just pass through tissue their half-life needs to be also long enough in order to be detected but also short enough so that they do not stay in your system for a long time their activity must also be large enough so it can be detected from outside of the body. Uh, there's no use of just using a radioactive material, for instance, that uh, does not have enough activity for it to be detected. It must be non-toxic as well for obvious reasons. What are some examples? The most typical ones, and you need to know these for the spec, are technetium 99M. So I'm going to underline this because we need to know this for the spec. Then the other one is fluorine 18. So technetium is normally used for monitoring major organs. So that would be heart, kidney, brain. It's got a half-life of six hours. I don't think you actually need to know this for the exam. I thought it'd be nice to just illustrate illustrate this. Fluorine 18 is used in PET scans, and uh, I'm going to give you a rundown when you look at the PET scan in uh, in a little bit. That has a half life of about 110 minutes.
Okay, so here's our radioactive tracer that's, uh, let's say, inside some sort of a tissue or in the bloodstream, etc. Now, how do we actually know, how do we have an information on what the, um, on what our object is? In order to do so, we're going to be using a gamma camera. So the operation of the gamma camera is a super important question. The main components of a gamma camera are a collimator, a scintillator, some photomultiplier tubes, which are just here, and finally a computer, which is actually building the 3D image of a gamma camera. Now, how does a gamma camera actually work? First off, we have the collimator. Now, the collimator just um, essentially consists of thin lead tubes. The idea behind the thin lead tubes is that only gamma rays which are traveling parallel to those lead tubes can pass through and the rest of them are absorbed. For instance, uh, these here are some gamma rays traveling in all directions and let's say this one here is not parallel, it gets absorbed over here, they, all of these ones get absorbed, but the ones which are parallel uh, move through. So after that we just have a collimated beam of uh, gamma rays. Col collimated here, all it means is that they're moving parallel to each other. After that, the um, our x-rays are going to, our parallel line of x-rays will pass through the scintillator, which is just a sodium iodide crystal. I've also heard this uh, referred to as just crystal in the past. So each gamma ray that strikes the scintillator will actually produce multiple visible light photons. And this is the main job of the scintillator to convert the gamma ray photons into visible light. After that, the, uh, the individual pieces of uh, visible light will pass through the photomultiplier tube in which a single photon of visible light is converted into an electrical signal, which is voltage. Well, hang on a minute. Once you have voltage, you can use that to produce a 3D image and the electrical signal now is used to create an image of the concentration of the gamma rays and hence the tracer. So once again over here is uh, just a typical representation of the gamma camera with the sufficient information for you guys to score all the available marks in an exam. Okay guys now let's have a look at the PET scan. Now what is the PET scan. First off, our patient will be actually surrounded by a whole ring of gamma detectors. Now, a gamma detectors is simply a whole bunch of gamma cameras. A tracer that emits a positron is injected into the patient. So these are our first points over here. Now, once you have a tracer that is emitting a positron, annihilation will occur. Because as soon as we have a positron in the body of the patient, it will almost instantly annihilate with an electron. Now, this will actually produce two gamma ray photons. And um, let's just write, or let me just label that that's those are the two gamma rays, and they really are just a product of, uh, of um, electron-positron annihilation. And the annihilation, in this case in my diagram, just occurs over here. It produces two photons that will be traveling in opposite directions. And this is really important, so I'm just going to underline that. And uh, that happens because of conservation of momentum. We can actually use the delay time to determine the location of the annihilation. So, uh, in other words, one photon, let's say, strikes this detector here at a certain time, the other photon strikes this detector at a certain time, and um, judging by the difference in times, you can actually work out the location of the annihilation. And then a computer is actually connected to these gamma cameras, and it's used to actually form an image. It is also important to mention that the medical tracers, we mentioned uh, before the radioactive tracer that is typically used for this is fluorine 18 that is typically used for 
PET scan. So this is really important. Okay, now what are some advantages and disadvantages of this method of imaging? So first off, it's a non-invasive technique, meaning that the patient will not require surgery. It can also actually produce some real-time images which is completely invaluable to medicine. And we also have some disadvantages. First off, a radioactive source is used for this. And, you know, the patient will be exposed to, to some small amounts of, uh, of uh, radioactivity. And it's also very, very expensive indeed. Okay, guys, now let's talk a little bit about ultrasound. Now, first off, what is ultrasound? Ultrasound is just simply sound, which is above 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. For medical purposes, though, typically the ultrasound used is of the order of uh, megahertz. Okay, well, what is the piezoelectric effect? First off, some crystals will produce a PD if they are compressed. So imagine that I have a little crystal over here and I, I apply, let's say, a force F, which is trying to compress it from both sides. If that's the case, I could actually detect some voltage between the uh, between the sides. But the also the opposite is also true. So if I was to apply PD, a crystal will start to vibrate. This is typically used in a device which is known as a transducer. And a transducer, uh, essentially a high frequency alternating PD is applied to the crystal. In this case, the crystal is just over here. And we actually apply a uh, high PD across the sides of its um, of its faces. Now it's very important that we need to use a high frequency alternating PD because if we don't, if we use DC current that is not changing direction, then we're not going to get any vibration. And it's important that it's at its natural frequency because then resonance will occur. The reverse is also true, and ultrasound can be, uh, let's say that there's ultrasound which is incoming um, from, uh, from here, then if that is the case, well, this device can also detect ultrasound because we're going to vibrate the size of this crystal, which will then in turn produce a PD and will allow it to be detected. So just to summarize some crystal crystals produce a PD when they're compressed. The opposite is also true. So if you apply PD, the crystal will vibrate. In a transducer, we need to use a high frequency alternating PD uh, that will essentially vibrate the crystal at its natural frequency. Resonance will occur. The reverse is also true and you can use this to detect ultrasound. Now let's have a look at the principles of ultrasound scanning. Here we have our piezoelectric transducer once again, and let's say we've pointed it, let's say, at an eye, and we want to image the eye using ultrasound. How does that work? So we've said we're using a piezoelectric crystal transducer, and this is our first point that we need to uh, write down. Our second one will be that the ultrasound pulses will be reflected at the boundary of each tissue. For instance, let's say that there's a difference in tissue here that will reflect in um, in a spike in our graph. Because this is a uh, transducer, we're going to be plotting a essentially a one-dimensional graph of voltage against time. This is an example of an ultrasound A scan and uh, the main principle is that we have a VT, a voltage against time graph, which is just one dimensional. The intensity of the um, of the reflected wave will actually depend on the something known as the acoustic impedance of the boundary, which we're going to revise in just a second. But the main idea is that ultrasound pulses are reflected at the boundary of each tissue. What do I mean by that? Imagine that we apply some PD to this crystal and it starts emitting ultrasound. As soon as it reaches this boundary, some of it will be reflected backwards. And then as soon as we have a boundary change here as well, some of it will be reflected. And then here we have another one. Then we're going to have some more reflected backwards. Each of those will produce a spike 
here, 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 and here on the voltage against time graph. And you can use the time of delay to determine the thickness of the boundary. The equation is that our thickness is equal to our distance traveled by the ultrasound divided by 2. Where does the factor of 2 come from? Well, the ultrasound will actually travel there, but then we'll also have to travel back. So we're going to need to divide that by 2. Our equation is that our thickness is the distance traveled, which is just the speed of sound times the time divided by 2. So when we talked about ultrasound, we mentioned that uh, in an ultrasound scan, the intensity of the reflected wave depends on the acoustic impedance of the boundary. Now, what exactly is an acoustic impedance? It tells us how much of the ultrasound is reflected and how much it actually is transmitted. The acoustic impedance is defined as the product of the density of the material. This is just our standard density in kilograms per cubic meter, multiplied by C, which is the speed of sound in that material. So that's the speed of sound in the, um, in the tissue or, or air or the material, etc. Now, what are the base units for acoustic impedance? Because acoustic impedance is just rho times C, density times, uh, times speed, so it's going to be kilograms per cubic meter multiplied by C, which is just measured in meters per second. Therefore, the units of impedance are simply going to be kilograms multiplied by m to the power of minus 2, s to the power of minus 1. The equation for acoustic impedance is the following. This is an equation which is typically given in your formula booklet, and it simply tells us that IR of I0 is equal to Z2 minus Z1 squared over Z2 plus Z1 squared. So Z2 and Z1 are just the two acoustic impedances. So let's say that we have an ultrasound which is going through a couple of tissues. Let's, uh, let's say that it starts off with Z1 and it's moving along here and then it changes to a different boundary which is Z2. IR is just the reflected intensity. So that's just the reflected intensity and I0 is our original intensity. Notice a property of that equation that um, if uh, Z2 is equal to Z1, then that means that IR over I0 will actually be equal to zero because the top of this fraction will now be zero. So the ratio of the reflected over the original intensity is equal to zero. The only way this could happen is if the reflected intensity is equal to zero. In other words, no sound or no ultrasound is reflected. Now, this equation is actually used for a process known as impedance matching. So there's actually a bit of a problem when you're doing ultrasound imaging and that is that when ultrasound passes from air to skin most of it will be reflected as simply the uh, ratio of IR to I0 is nearly 1. So this means that in normal situation let's say that this here was my transducer and this here was the patient's skin. If I held it there and I started releasing ultrasound, most of it will be reflected backwards, so we wouldn't be able to image anything in the region here. So in order to prevent this, what uh, you tend to do is you tend to use a gel which has essentially um, a acoustic impedance which is very very similar to that of the skin and if that's the case almost none of the ultrasound is reflected at that initial boundary which allows the ultrasound to pass through and uh, to summarize when ultrasound passes from air to skin most of it will normally be reflected so we put this uh, ultrasound gel across here and most of the ultrasound will pass through the skin and you can image 
what's on the other side. Okay, guys, up to the final part of today's very, very large revision lesson, and that is using ultrasound to determine the speed of blood in arteries. Now, just please pay attention because it's a very, very typical exam question. So we can actually use a combination of ultrasound imaging and the Doppler effect to work out the speed of blood in arteries. In order to do so, we need um, an ultrasound transducer, and that is held very close to a blood ar artery and is held at an angle. In a minute, we're going to explain why. An ultrasound pulse is reflected by the blood vessels in the artery. So we send some ultrasound across here, then some of it is reflected backwards. Now, blood vessels which are traveling towards the detector will be reflecting at a higher frequency and blood vessels uh, traveling away from the transducer will be reflected at lower frequencies because that's essentially our Doppler effect. The change of frequency is actually proportional to the speed and we can use this equation just here to work out the speed of uh, blood in, in an artery. So the transducer will be able to essentially give us delta F, the change in frequency, and using this equation, we can work out the speed. A difficult question here would be, why do we have to hold this at an angle? Well, let's have a look at this equation. If the transducer was perpendicular, so theta would be at 90 degrees. So at theta is equal to 90 degrees, cos of theta, will be just zero, which means that our change in frequency will also be zero hertz. And if that's the case, we will not be able to find the speed of an artery. So the only way to do that would be to hold this at an angle. Typically, it's a 45 degree angle. Okay, folks, well, we've actually covered the vast majority of um, medical physics on the A-level physics specification. Hopefully you found this video useful. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.